Welcome back to the Today Show. Our guest today is Anthony Summers, award-winning author, and we're talking about Marilyn Monroe and Norma Jean Baker. Now, Anthony, in 1985, you published a book, Goddess, The Secret Lives of Marilyn Monroe, and now you have a release, The Mystery of Marilyn Monroe, The Unheard Tapes. What are the major differences between the two bodies of work? Well, you're referring to the, the title of my book, well, Goddess, um, and, and the name of the Netflix film that I'm told 15 to 20 million people have watched in, in the last um, couple of months. Um, it's been an extraordinary success. Uh, and um, net, the Netflix people came to me and, and said they wanted to do a, a film about Monroe based on, on an arising from my work. Mm -hmm. And in the course of casual talking over cups of coffee, and stuff a bit stronger, um, it emerged that um, I had in, in a storeroom upstairs the audio tapes of most of the interviews that I conducted for the Monroe book back in, uh, in, in the 80s, in the early 80s. And Netflix were amazed and astounded and delighted. I had kept those interviews um, because at the time largely for legal reasons. What, why does one record an interview? Well, I record them to make sure that, that, that the, any quotes I use are absolutely accurate. You also needed to make sure that they were absolutely accurate right. um, in case the lawyer said, um, and you probably know about this, in case the lawyer, did he or she really say that? Well, compared to scrappy notes in a notebook, having an audio tape, was ideal. And I had kept these interviews initially from the Monroe book, 650 of them, wow. initially in a leaky old shed on, on my property here. Uh, and eventually, um, because I was advised that they were valuable, as they turned out to be in the end, eventually in a, in a proper storeroom. And they mercifully existed for the Netflix people and they exist today for anybody who wants to go and listen to them at the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Sciences. Now I've donated them to the Academy of Motion Picture Sciences mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. So during your investigations and, and speaking with 650 uh, people there, you had found flawed evidence, inconsistent statements, and a conflicting timeline, which fuels further speculation that the silver screen icon was murdered. Is there something specific that stands out to you from your investigation? Let me be clear. Do you mean from my investigation of her life or, or the investigative circumstances of her death? I would say the circumstances surrounding her death. Ah. Well, the, what kicked off for me, what kicked off the project was that I, well, I was not going to do a book at all. I was in a major British newspaper um, to go to Los Angeles because the district attorney in Los Angeles was had reopened the investigation into how she had died and the various mysteries that everyone said about one way or the other mm. about how she died and, and what what were the inconveniences in, in the accounts of her death. And, and of course, the major point, did she probably commit suicide, the verdict of the district attorney's office and, and at the time, um, the coroner um, at the time, or that question that people asked so loosely, or was she murdered? Um, and so I was asked to go and do a newspaper piece. And I got there and did five or six interviews. And I realized I was drawn in and I sent a mm -hmm. cable to London, the cables in those days, saying, um, I don't really want to do this article at all. I'd rather either drop it altogether or, or do a book. And the, um, the the newspaper in London mercifully said, well, no, you don't have to pay us your, you pay us the, the flight to Los Angeles back. Stay there, do your book, and we want first option on the on the rights. 
So um, I set, set about wor working on the book. I was just drawn into it by the fact that there were so many seemingly unanswered questions. And especially important for me, there were a number of people who hadn't given interviews back when she died in 1962, 20 years-ish earlier, um, but seemed to me ready to talk now because they themselves were getting a little bit older. And, and the beauty of that now is that I interviewed people, most of whom, not all, but most of whom have since themselves died. Oh. So the interviews that, that I conducted become a, a, an old sort of, sort of treasure. And in the end, with my then wife and, and child, I, I, I um, rented, a, rented a little house uh, up in Topanga Canyon, um, down the coast a little way from um, Santa Maria, and worked very, very hard for, I think, about 18 months to two years, and then for another year uh, in, in Europe on, on, on the project. And, and it worked out for, worked mercifully for me. Wow. I think it's, I think it's because all, all, all the books that I've done uh, have been thorough because I don't think, for me, there's no other way to, to, to face yourself if you put something down in, in print in, in a book. You have right. to be able to look over your shoulder and say, I did that as right as I could. Nothing's perfect, but you get it as right as you possibly could. And I think particularly now that I've been able to finesse some things in the, the last six months for the new edition of the book, which is still called Goddess, like it was in, in the first place. Mm. Um, I think for, for history's sake, um, it's, it's as correct as it could be. Okay. I, I don't mean to brag about that. No, I just no. think it's in, important to, in this case where so much twaddle has been written about Marilyn Monroe and especially about the end of her life and 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 her affairs with the or alleged affairs with the Kennedy brothers and so on. Um, it it really was important to to try and drive drive some truth through all the gossip. No, that's fair. So were we... That, were we that elusive thing called truth. <laughs> when we when we talk about the truth, I'm just wondering if I can get your opinion on a, on a controversial statement that she actually made once saying that, you know, she longed to put on a black wig, pick up her father in a bar, make love to him, and then ask, you know, how do you feel now that you've had a daughter that you've made love to? With your intimate knowledge of of Marilyn and the limelight she was in, what do you? It, was there something underlining there? Was she trying to secretly say something? Was it as literal as she meant it to be? Well, she said that privately um, to a wealthy businessman called Rosenfeld, um, Henry Rosenfeld, um, whom she knew in New York City. Hmm. He remembered vividly, wouldn't remember vividly being told that by, by Marilyn Monroe, with whom he himself had had an affair. And he was himself an older man. Um, and she was talking about father. It was a statement. She made, she made such statements. She made them humorously and she made them seriously. Um, who can tell when it's just out of an anecdote? But I do believe that she said it and it's clear that she was very mixed up about her paternity, about who her father had been. Um, she didn't grow up most of the time with her mother. Her mother was a disturbed woman who spent Marilyn's life in um, what we were used to be allowed to do in asylum. Um, mm -hmm. And um, who was religiously obsessed. Um, Marilyn, as she was growing up, would talk about who her daddy had been. And her mother, at one point, would point to a photograph on the wall of a man with a little moustache who looked like Clark Gable. And through mm -hmm. Marilyn's growing up, Clark Gable 
became a sort of romantic father figure. And of course, in the end, she acted alongside Clark Gable. Um, so she was in a real muddle about, and remained in a muddle about older men and about her real father. She did research into who her father had been. And there were a, 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 a couple of principal candidates. I believe from talking to one of the candidates relatives that she did go at one point um, and try to talk to the guy who may have been her father, a fellow called Gifford. Um, and that he was, didn't turn her away, but it came came to nothing. He didn't welcome her. Um, so this was a big upset for her. What she meant by saying that she'd like to sleep with her father and then reveal that he, he just to him that he just slept with his daughter. God knows what was going on in her mind, but <clears throat> she talked like that. She in private she would talk, talk the hind legs off off a donkey, and you you couldn't quite know ever what was serious and what wasn't she was an emotional model um and of course her last few years and and before that a great deal of time was spent with with psychiatrists her state of mind is very much related to virtually everything and certainly in the last 10 years of her life from her 20s to through her 30s and I could, if you like, I, I, I was able to get hold of um, some of her last psychiatrist notes, and I could, if you like, read, read to you from them. Yes, please, if you do, that would be amazing. Um, the, he, he was Dr. Um, Greenson was his name, and he looked after her for the last two or three years of her life. She had a psychiatrist on the East Coast in New York, and she had, um, and she turned to Dr. Greenson on the West Coast. He was a famous Freudian psychiatrist. And um, he reported what she was telling him to the East Coast psychiatrist so that the two of them could liaise with each other. Right. And he died by the time I got into the book, but his widow allowed me to see the letters and so on that he'd sent to the East Coast psychiatrist, which now, ironically, um, are all locked up and won't be opened in, in, in the library that holds them for many years. So we do, in that sense, have an exclusive to, to the notes. That's he awesome. noticed at once that she seemed, when she first went to see him towards the end of her life, heavily sedated. She was slurring her words, had poor reaction. She seemed remote, seemed unable to understand conversational conversation and rambled on incoherently. She wanted to go straight onto the couch for Freudian therapy, which um, she knew all about. She'd read up about she'd read about everything. And she'd read about that. But Dr. Greenson, who was alarmed by the state of her, decided instead on supportive therapy rather than deep psychoanalysis. And he started looking into her every day. But what he did was completely un atypical of Freudian psychology, mm -hmm. um, psychiatry. He invited her into his family because he thought what she seemed to lack above all was real human kind and, and friendship and the sort of thing that when I mercifully, hopefully have in, in our lives all, all the time that ordinary people have in their lives all the time and by that time the famous Marilyn Monroe was in truth a very lonely figure what he came to believe at the end was that he noted and here's the, the technical speak medical speak symptoms of paranoia and depressive reaction to signs of schizophrenia he knew above all that he was dealing with a psyche so fragile that it could crumble into crisis at any time, which is very much what happened in, in her final years. Wow. We have he, to take he did a... notice something else which would 
would would and this is a, a, again an interesting quote in terms of how we all think of Marilyn Monroe, the, the extraordinary glamour puss. Mm -hmm. That he reported the, the report reported that rather pathetically, this sec sexually dissatisfied woman gloried and reveled in her personal appearance, feeling that she was genuinely an extremely beautiful woman, perhaps the most beautiful woman in the world. Well, one can't think of anything more likely to mess a man or woman up, and especially a, a, a woman, in thinking that they're, quote, the most beautiful woman in the world, which, of course, is a, a human being that doesn't exist. Jeez. That's, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. We're going to take a, a quick break and we'll be right back. <laughs> 